And I'm also uh, just a, a little bit of life in 2020. So my four-year-old was sent home to self-isolate because they had a positive case in her year group. The child is fine, but that means she's home. So because of that, I'm going to be turning my camera off just because she's four and she's wonderfully creative and unpredictable. So she may come in and try and join our call. So to um, sort of hedge against that, I'm going to turn my camera off, but rest assured I'm here and I'll be speaking with you, okay? So let's begin. Um, see, camera off. Okay, so. Welcome to Archives in Action. Collections and Heritage Site Management. I'm Heather Alcock, Heritage Conservation Officer for Port Sunlight Village Trust and Project Manager for the National Lottery Heritage Fund Project Drawn Together. For today's talk, we ask you to please turn off your video and keep yourselves muted. 68 people have registered for today's talk and my Wi-Fi couldn't possibly handle that much excitement. If you have any questions or comments, please type them into the chat room and we will try to answer them at the end of the presentations. We have written archives in action for listed property owners, archivists and museum professionals with an interest in heritage site management. Peer-to-peer -peer learning has been one of the most rewarding aspects of the Drawn Together project. And this event is an extension of that work. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers from the Royal Institute of British Architects, Melanie Bailey Maloney, archivist, and Amy Finn, project curator. Melanie joined Reba as their archivist in January of this year. Her initial focus is Reba's archive and the Leslie Martin collection. Before joining Reba, she was working at Alexandra Palace, setting up their newly discovered archive. She previously worked in the archives of the Church of England, UCL and Rambert Dance Company. Amy joined the Reba to work on a project to catalog the archive of Collins St. John Wilson and Partners. The project is currently in its second year and once back in the office, she'll be looking at the files and drawings related to the British Library. She has previously worked in the archives of the Church of England. My background is in material science for building, heritage policy and planning and um, adaptive use for historic buildings and my experience is in both the United States and the United Kingdom. Port Sunlight Village Trust or PSVT as we like to be known is an independent charity founded in 1999. Our workforce is committed to making Port Sunlight an inspiring place to live, work and visit. Our charitable work is funded by rental income from 300 grade two listed houses and our community or commercial buildings. An annual grant from Unilever, which is scheduled to end in 2023, grants and donations for our museum and special events. PSVT is responsible for the care and promotion of the entire village, but we do not own all of it. Over 600 of the grade two listed houses are privately owned and major stakeholders like Rural Council and Network Rail also manage and maintain important aspects of the public realm. Last year, Port Sunlight Village Trust celebrated its 20th anniversary, launched its first strategic plan and implemented a 10 year conservation management plan. This year, PSVT was poised to open SoapWorks a family-friendly interactive experience about the science of soap and its life-saving properties. COVID has delayed the launch of this wonderful new experience, but we look forward to opening our doors soon. Drawn Together, oops. Drawn Together was made possible by National Lottery players. PSVT and four Northwest project partners have created a digital archive of original drawings for the village. The documents, which include 1,500 original drawings, illustrate founder William Lever's vision for Port Sunlight, 
an industrial model village for his workers and the artistic and physical development, expansion and evolution of that village over a span of 50 years. Drawn Together is the first phase of a digital archive, which brought together for the first time, both the project partners and the holdings from four significant collections. Unilever Art Archives and Records Management, Rural Archives, Bolton Library and Museum Services, and National Museums Liverpool. A catalog of the drawings has been created and a selection of drawings from each of the project partners was digitized. Drawn Together will launch an online catalog to exhibit drawings from the di digital collection later this year. Before we share examples with you, I felt it was important to speak a little bit about a very relevant legal concern, copyright. Copyright applies to work, not ideas, and the first Copyright Act was passed in 1709. In 1911, protection under the Act was extended to architectural works. Copyright protects drawings, diagrams, maps, charts, plans, and models, as well as actual buildings. Copyright extends for the lifetime of the creator and a further 70 years from the year in which they died. This is significant for the Port Sunlight Collection since one of the most prolific village architects, James Lomax Simpson, died in 1977. While the Drawn Together project could digitize Lomax Simpson's works under the Creative Commons license, CC, BY, NC, and D, for those of you who follow these kinds of things, and make them accessible for research purposes, we cannot display them in the online catalog or share them with you for this talk, which is being recorded, I should mention. Although today's talk is not about the history of Port Sunlight, nor about the undeniably complex and at times impossible to reconcile actions of its founder, William Lever, I thought I should share a few of the key facts about the place. Port Sunlight's founder, William Lever, was born in 1851 in Bolton to a middle-class family who owned a wholesale grocery business. He left school at 16 to join the family business. William and his brother James decided to specialize in one product, which is soap. Lever Brothers went on to become one of the world's first global companies and it brought William Lever tremendous wealth. Initially, Lever Brothers rented manufacturing premises, but soon demand outstripped capacity. Lever Brothers bought a marshy piece of land along the River Mersey, which despite the deep tidal inlets as was well suited for rail, road and water access. The site was large enough to build the soap works and a worker village, with construction of the works starting in 1888 and the first houses occupied by 1889. In 1891, Lever Brothers had built their first community facility, Gladstone Hall, and they were publishing visitor guidebooks to promote the works and the village. By the start of the First World War, the village housed over 4,000 residents who enjoyed a wide range of facilities, including two schools, an open air swimming bath, 3,000 seat theater, gymnasium, library, savings bank, social club, shops, church, tennis and bowling lawns, football pitch, and of course a pub. The houses and facilities were set in a generous landscape with passive green spaces, design landscapes, and allotments. During Lever's lifetime, 29 different architectural practices contributed designs for Port Sunlight, and no two terraces are alike. Lever Brothers eventually became global manufacturing giant Unilever, and Unilever invested in the management and maintenance of Port Sunlight as a benefit to its workforce an advertisement for its products and the spiritual home of its founder until 1979 when the decision was made to sell off the houses. Tenants were given the first option to buy their homes and many did. Over the next 20 years, two thirds of the houses were sold. The sale of houses stopped in 1999 when Port Sunlight Village Trust was created to look after the village. 
Now, as this talk is about collections and heritage site management, and I believe that many of you are not involved in heritage site management, but I could be wrong. I thought it would be useful just to talk about what it is. So heritage site management is a multidisciplinary practice of preserving, protecting, and promoting heritage in its various forms. Oops. Oh, Dave, oh, could you mute yourself, please? Uh, I'll do it. There we go. The first step is typically to identify heritage or where this is established by statutory listing to improve the understanding of heritage. Two key concepts are used for this work, significance or value and integrity or the physical intactness of a site. Once these key points are established, heritage site managers have a set of tools they can use to fulfill their role through partnership working. These include routine maintenance, conservation, which is the stabilization of a site in its existing condition, restoration, which is the reconstruction of lost or severely deteriorated aspects of a site, enhancements such as alterations, extensions, or other new work, and even demolition, which is the partial or complete removal of a site or feature. In addition to these physical actions, heritage site managers can engage with the local community and visitors to raise awareness about the site and encourage people to interact with or learn from the heritage. Heritage site managers can develop policies or engage with local and national government to enforce heritage law or support property owners. Lastly, heritage site managers look to the future with forward and financial planning to ensure the long-term sustainability of their site. When are archives useful? This is a little bit of a trick question, of course, because for 19th and 20th century sites like Port Sunlight, the answer is almost always yes. However, much earlier sites or sites without the continuity of stewardship, which Port Sunlight has benefited from, archives may be less useful for those sites. However, you should always check. Also, archival research is just one strand. Of, of work for a heritage site. It needs to be combined with site analysis, community engagement, conservation science, funding and financial planning, landscape management, environmental sustainability and accessibility. Working together, these multiple disciplines can come up with a well-rounded solution for a heritage site. So if we go back to the beginning, this concept of significance, which is the first tool in a heritage site manager's arsenal, it's perhaps the most obvious use of architectural collections as we can use them to better understand the value of a site. For Port Sunlight, the drawings are the creative output and practical expression of both Lever and his architect's vision for a worker's village. If a collection includes the full range of drawings for a building, a researcher can see how the design concept changed from the sales pitch to construction. The drawings also frame a way of thinking about the people and aesthetic movements for the time. For example, Charles Riley advocated for neoclassical design and the City Beautiful movement promoted by American designers at the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. In fact, Riley was a vocal critic of the arts and crafts movement, which defines Port Sunlight. Yet Lever commissioned him to design 15 to 27 Lower Road, which is illustrated on the slide in front of you. This terrace, in my opinion, is the most unique building in the village, reflecting design progressions at the turn of the 20th century, yet somehow not out of place amongst its arts and crafts peers. Well, that was at least until the Lady Lever was built in front of it. I suspect that Lever had the last laugh. Our understanding of significance extends far beyond architectural plans. The second most obvious source of information from collections is period photographs, which provide solid evidence about what, when, and even how the built heritage was at a specific moment in time. For Port Sunlight, beyond the photographs and beyond the drawings, 
Publications like visitor brochures, advertising, and periodicals promoted the village around the world. Maintenance records from the estate management department describe how the architecture performed after the architect walked away. Life events recorded in newspapers capture the value society placed on venues and shifts in use or relevance of places. Maps and site plans track major changes and future plans. Objects and architectural fragments provide concrete evidence about how people lived alongside manufacturing processes, materials, and colors. Collections can provide clues about the rarity or value of a site or a feature of that site. So this is one of the early um, souvenir brochures for the village and the works. Collections can support understanding of complex and challenging histories. Port Sunlight Village Trust is commissioning academic research to better understand William Lever's actions abroad and closer to home. We will work alongside our partners to better ensure that Port Sunlight tells a full and balanced story. The second founding principle for heritage site management is integrity or the intactness of a site. This can include the original as built condition. Let's see, sorry guys, someone coming late. There we go. Or any additions or alterations that contribute to the value or heritage character of the site. Value shifts with time and can be assessed on an individual basis as a single terrace or as a whole for the entire conservation area. Architectural drawings, period photographs, and property records in collections tell the story of a site's integrity and its alteration chronology. So this is the gorgeous 31 to 35 Cornish Road, which is a Jonathan Simpson. And as you can tell, if you compare the two, if I'm able to do that, it retains incredibly high integrity. And in fact, we're able to demonstrate through archives and collections that Port Sunlight retains exceptionally high integrity for the exterior of its built heritage. Integrity for the interiors is less common, but where it can be identified for the original layout or features, its rarity increases its heritage value and therefore work should be done to protect or conserve these features. The concept of conservation or stabilization of a feature or site in its existing condition is important for heritage site management. Collections may include records of previous treatments or repairs. For Port Sunlight, the estate management records included a scope of work, tender documents and invoices for the work done to clean the Dell Bridge ahead of centenary celebrations. Unfortunately, the method specified was sandblasting, which heavily damaged the soft sandstone masonry and figurative work for the listed asset. Although the site has clear physical damage from this work, the archival evidence informs future tr treatments or strategies for repair. The same is true for the presentation of the bronze statuary at the Lever Hume Memorial. Maintenance records include previous treatments for the bronzes, which remove the patina and any coatings back to bare metal. A new patina was then applied before the bronzes were waxed. However, there is no evidence in the archives that the finished color selected, which is this gray presently, was based on archival or physical evidence. In fact, recent research, including reference in numerous period newspaper accounts from the unveiling ceremony, has demonstrated that the bronzes were originally finished with a rich green patina. This was further demonstrated by the green patina found on a maquette produced ahead of fabrication. This object held by the tape provides a link between the paper archives and the physical artwork. Awareness of the original finished color for the bronzes could inform future treatment recommendations. Reconstruction or rebuilding of missing features. 
Arts. Architectural drawings offer heritage site managers with both the big picture and sometimes even the fine details. These shop drawings were used by fabricators to build a terrace on Primrose Hill. If desired, and indeed if copyright allowed, the plans could be used by modern fabricators to recreate the features illustrated. Although it may seem odd to show a photograph of bomb damage for a slide entitled Enhancements, it provides an example of where and how new work could be introduced in Port Sunlight without harming original or historic features. Copyright prevents me from sharing the original and post-war reconstruction, reconstruction sorry, drawings for Pool Bank. However, through archival research, PSVT was able to identify mid-century outhouses at the backs of the reconstructed houses. These simple concrete roof structures detract from the heritage character of the listed terrace and the conservation area. Because of the site history for these properties, there is greater flexibility with regard to the appropriateness of building additions or extensions to the rear of the properties. In a similar vein, forward planning documents found in the estate management collections and property files illustrate the refurbishment work carried out for 700 of Port Sunlight's listed houses. Where original layout remains, in other words, where this work was not done, this is a rare and important feature in the property's heritage character. Where it has been altered, as shown above, there is greater flexibility for change. We believe that Port Sunlight is a beautiful place. Nothing compares to a walk through the village on a sunny day. But when this is not possible, especially in times like these, archives and collections include gorgeous watercolor renderings of the site, which convey both the quality of the architecture and the intended healthy open green setting. Collections also offer site managers with a chance to share what has been lost from a site over time to inspire forward planning, fundraising, and community engagement. Archives and collections underpin heritage policy initiatives. This period photograph captures the mid 20th century refurbishment work that was completed by Unilever Merseyside Limited to update the houses with modern kitchens and three-piece bathrooms. This work, which was largely completed after the houses were listed, was done without modifications to the fronts of the houses. However, masonry openings were altered and new windows installed at the backs of houses to comply with building regulations for the time. The collections inform us that this investment and refurbishment program was completed for over 700 houses, leaving most with window assemblies resembling the ones shown here. While well-intentioned and effective for ensuring the livability of the houses through the second half of the 20th century, this type of work would not be acceptable for a listed building today. PSVT worked in partnership with World Council and Historic England to support the gradual improvement of the heritage character at the backs of the houses by developing a local listed buildings and consent order. This provides blanket consent for replacement of severely deteriorated or inappropriate rear doors, yard gates, and rear windows. The extensive documentary evidence and rationale required for this type of sweeping consent will have long-term and direct influence on the built heritage, and this relied completely on the architectural collections held by Unilever Archives and World Archives. Enforcement. Port Sunlight's listed houses are managed by statutory protections. Nearly all of the houses were listed in 1965 and the entire village became a conservation area in 1978. Despite this, some properties have inappropriate or unauthorized works. These changes detract from the heritage character of the listed house and erode the value of the conservation area. 
Enforcement cases are managed by the local planning authority and the owners can receive fines or other penalties for illegal works. Archives, including original drawings, period photographs, and property records support enforcement cases and the eventual reconstruction of lost heritage features. Forward planning. Just like our predecessors, Port Sunlight Village Trust is thinking about the future of Port Sunlight and what, what place it could have in 21st century society. How can we improve its environmental sustainability, diversify its landscapes to improve, um, well, excuse me, stumbling on myself, to improve its biodiversity, there we go, Heather, and also to improve its accessibility. How can we provide services or facilities for residents and visitors that are currently missing and in fact have eroded over time? These forward planning documents each begin with a key scope of work, which is archival research. And through our partnership with these four local collections, we are able to put together a well-rounded story of the past for Port Sunlight to inform its future. Thank you. So now we will move on to Melanie. Let's see. Melanie, can you unmute yourself? Thank you. I'll mute myself. Thanks for that, it was really interesting. So I thought I'd start off our talk with just a brief introduction to the collections. Um, so the collections of the Royal Institute of British Architects date back to the 15th century and include items as varied as correspondence, architectural models and drawings, photographs, drawing tables, and even some Lego. We hold archive material relating to influential figures such as Palladio, Sir Charles Barry, and Sir Leslie Martin, as well as over 150,000 books covering almost all aspects of architecture and architectural history. The current slide shows the original design for the library at Portland Place, which to this day retains its distinctive style. Our photographic collection contains over 1.6 million images a percentage of which can be accessed via Rebapix alongside, alongside some digitized material of other aspects of our collections. Um, if we could just see the next slide, um, you'll be able to see our homepage and the URL for that if you want to go and check it out yourself. This has been an invaluable resource for us this year, especially um, during the pandemic for both researchers and for us members of staff, while we've all been separated from physical access to the archive itself. It's also always a great resource for those interested in our collections who live around the world. Our collections are used by a broad range of users, including architectural students, historians, architectural practices and property owners. The benefits of an architectural archive are far reaching, allowing us to see trends and developments in the architectural landscape, minimizing exploratory work and the associated costs required when making changes to existing structures as well as assisting with campaigns to save buildings. Today, we'll provide some short case studies on times when architectural archives have been used to great effect and when problems could have been avoided by referring to them. A building's life stretches way beyond the involvement of the original architect. And so it's important to retain and preserve plans and other material. White Lodge in Richmond Park, if we have the next slide now, Built as a hunting lodge for King George II by Roger Morris and now home to the Royal Valley School, originally had a flagstone basement, which was replaced with tarmac in more recent years. When it began to suffer from rising damp, it could have been a costly exercise to find out what the problem was and how it could be fixed. Instead, the chartered surveyor was able to view the plans held in our collections, which showed features that made it easy to clear the drains and therefore stop the damp. Unfortunately, our own headquarters at Portland Place, a 1930s building designed by George Gray Wernham, doesn't have such an easy relationship with its historic structure. The plans for the building were originally retained by facilities and used as working documents, meaning that additions and amendments were applied directly onto the plans. They've now been passed to the collections team, but they are not yet fully catalogued, meaning that it's not always easy to pinpoint the exact plan that you need. As a result, whenever building work is undertaken in Portland Place, there's inevitably something that isn't expected, which slows down progress. It's not merely the practical upkeep of the building, however, that can benefit from the presence of the archive, 
but also the interpretation of the space. Neil Chasseur has done some excellent work on the colonial history of the Royal Institute of British Architects and the way it is represented throughout its headquarters, both in decorative details and in the materials used. Going forward, more work will be undertaken to reinterpret the space and the archive will be vital in providing context for this work. Although it is plans and designs that have the most obvious practical applications, other parts of the archive can also be invaluable when it comes to caring for historic buildings. For example, Waterhouse's Grand Gothic University building in Liverpool features terracotta dressings. Opened in 1882 and now a grade two listed building, it remains an important part of the university. You can imagine then the distress when parts of the frontage began to fall off. It was only by referring to Waterhouse's correspondence that it became clear repairs had been undertaken using putty instead of terracotta. With time, the putty had begun to shrink, whereas the true terracotta sections had not, leading to the putty becoming dislodged. Having this written record allowed us to understand the structure of the building and the potential problems that arise from it. Historic buildings that serve modern purposes often throw up difficulties, and it's important for the current custodians to understand the structure of the building in order to safely manage and utilise the space. I previously worked as archivist at Alexandra Palace, a surviving remnant of the grand exhibition halls of the 19th century. Maintaining a building that was not originally intended to be a permanent structure, and one that's been through many catastrophes throughout its history, the original palace burnt down just two weeks after its opening, is no easy task, nor is using it as a modern events venue while respecting the historic fabric of the building. In their archive, there is a large collection of architectural plans from the 1980s restoration of the building after the fire that destroyed large sections of the palace. These continue to be invaluable in the day-to-day -day operations of the venue, providing information that determines whether or not certain features are feasible in preparing for events. As with my previous examples, much time and money can be saved in having these resources available and sufficiently catalogued so that relevant information can be found. They can also reveal proposed additions and alterations that didn't always come to fruition, such as the proposed planetarium that was partially constructed in the 1980s, but was sadly destroyed in a storm before it was finished. This offers inspiration and adds historic depth for interpretation of the building. Despite limited access being available, as the archive is only just beginning to be formalised, it is still used for engagement purposes, as well as for research for books on the history of the building, particularly of the Victorian theatre, which was reopened in 2018. Discoveries made during the works combined with the archive give a good sense of how the auditorium was structured and how the theatre machinery fit into it, allowing a sympathetic interpretation of the space. My colleague Amy will now detail further examples of architectural archive use in the restoration of historic buildings. Thank you, Melanie. Um, so, as Melanie said, um, the RIBA collections are often used by architects working on historic or listed buildings, and that's often to make sure that redevelopment or repair work is sympathetic to existing features or it's in keeping with the original aesthetic. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of examples and then also explore some of the other ways that archives can support built heritage sites. Um, so my first example, um, as you can see here, is Lutchen's um, 1920s Britannic House, um, which is an example of how archives can support the adaptation, really, of heritage sites. Um, so it's grade two listed. Um, it was originally commissioned for the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which is now BP. Um, and they occupied it as their headquarters from 1925 to 1967, and then again from 1991 to 2003. So obviously over that time, um, expectations of usage changes. And in the 90s, um, the building was redeveloped to meet the needs for increased office space and also to introduce um, better quality daylight into the central area. Um, the work's undertaken by William Nimmo and partners with um, Peter Inskip and Peter Jenkins consulting. Um, and it's a really characterised by that balance between conservation and the change and changing user needs. 
Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Um, the, so the listed status um, means that work had to be done within certain constraints, um, including that, as you can see here, the um, marble lined ground floor entrance halls and the barrel vaulted central staircase um, had to remain unaltered. So the value of the archive really comes into play when um, when you look at the results of this work, so including the unexecuted designs and those early initial sketches. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so consultation of Lutchen's early studies for the building actually led to the proposal that was put forward and executed, which was for an atrium to link the existing areas of the building, um, which meant that the floor and the stair and staircase could be preserved, they could remain and they could instead be um, restored. So the um, client brief was fulfilled, um, but also the integrity of the building was retained. Um, so, and then drawings from the archives were again consulted um, at a later date when um, handrails were installed in the entrance areas. So it which was again about making sure the design was sympathetic to the original aesthetic, but also ensuring that the building came up to current accessibility expectations. So in relation to historic buildings, um, the archive kind of really represents an opportunity for the building to keep growing and adapting and meeting user needs, but also to help it maintain its distinct character. Um, and the archive sort of almost accompanies the building through its life um, and is revisited at certain points um, and is sort of continually reactivated through its relationship to the building. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so when we're thinking about heritage sites, um, maintenance and repair of the fabric of the building um, is obviously really key, but also that sort of less tangible question of significance is really important, as Heather spoke about. So works to heritage sites are often considered in light of the impact that they might have on the building's significance. And it can be archaeological, architectural, artistic or historic. Um, so the Reba collections are used really extensively by heritage consultants who are preparing significant statements for conservation plans, for preparing listed building consent applications or for listing assessments. Um, so here's just a couple of examples of really well-known organisations, so the 20th Century Society and Historic England, who regularly use the collections to support their casework. Um, and it's also sort of ongoing. So, um, so we've had recently had inquiries about um, about Cranbrook Estate and about Chamberlain Powell and Bond's Golden Lane. So um, it's something that sort of continue, is, is ongoing. Um, could I have the new, next slide, please? Um, so I wanted to talk about this example, which um, a colleague actually talked to me about this, and he has previously worked on lin listed building applications. Um, and he actually used this image that you can see on the slide um, in a significant statement for an application for the City of London Girls School. Um, so this is on the Barbican Estate in London, um, designed by Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn. Um, and the school were actually looking to, quite recently to add a studio into the space, so to create a sort of first floor studio. Um, which would have significantly altered the character of the building and would have had a negative impact on its significance rating. Um, but actually this image, which my colleague found in the archives, revealed the, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there was um, there's white tiling around the um, entrance, around the pool, um, which had actually had been removed and lost. Um, so as part of the application, the school agreed that it would reinstate this um, tiling, so which was sort of helped to balance any negative effects that the redevelopment was going to have. So in this case, um, using the archive presented an opportunity to mitigate damage um, by reinstating historic features. Um, and I think it, it sort of really illustrates what a lot of this sort of work is about, that protecting built heritage isn't about stopping the clock, it's not about create, creating museum pieces, it's about preserving an asset's heritage interest, while also allowing it to 
grow and to adapt and meet changing user needs. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this next slide, it's quite a moody image of um, the Midland Hotel in Morecambe. Um, it looks a bit foreboding um, under that dark cloud, but anyway, um, I'd like to um, I'd like to use the exam this example um, and the next example actually to think about how archives and collections can play a role in um, regeneration projects for heritage sites. So not just in restoring or replacing architectural features, but also community engagement, which I think is a really important part of managing and sustaining a heritage site over time. Um, so the hotel opened in 1933. It was designed by Oliver Hill. Um, it's obviously in an art deco style. Um, and it was once a really, really fashionable place to stay. So guests apparently included Wallace Simpson, Winston Churchill. It was kind of the place to be seen. Um, but it fell into disrepair and it was boarded up and it was pretty much derelict. Um, until it was bought by Urban Splash in the early 2000s and they commissioned um, redevelopment work, or refurbishment work, sorry. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so the Reba archives um, hold some material for the architect Oliver Hill, including plans and drawings for the hotel, and also documents relating to the design, such as meeting notes or quotes from contractors and correspondence between the architect and the client, which was the London, Midland and Scottish railway company um, and the hotel's had a it's had a really troubled history but what it's also had is a really a great deal of local love and support and that's really what's ensured its survival um, and therefore like any sort of redevelopment or refurbishment was always going to need to respect that um, and that's where archives can be really useful as compelling evidence of what has gone before um, so Reflecting on the work done with the hotel um, last year in a blog post, um, Tom Bloxham from Urban Splash described the need for a sensitive approach that was empathetic to the affection felt for the hotel by many people. Um, and the architects who were also involved in the scheme, Union North, um, they described it as a balance between rescue and renovation and really emphasised the importance of ensuring that any work that was done or any building interventions were really appropriate. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, so this is just an example. You could, it's just basically, it's the cafe sort of then and now. So um, the image on the left, uh, that might be, actually, it might be back to front, um, but the black and white one anyway, it's my left, but the black and white image is, um, from dates back to the opening of the hotel, um, while the colour image um, was taken fairly recently after its renovation. And you can see that um, the work's been undertaken really sympathetically. The essential fabric of the building hasn't changed. It's been refreshed, um, but a modern seating has been added, but it really fits with that original aesthetic. And I think that's where having that visual record in the archive, having the drawings and the photographs, really supports that. Um, can I have the next slide now? Um, and the use of archives can also mean that interior features can be recreated um, so that the building retains its original feel. Um, so part of significance is also about that, the sort of artistic works and the, the interior as well as the um, exterior. Um, and the artistic interest of a heritage site um, can be really key and I think the, the archives relating to Oliver Hill um, at the RIBA includes correspondence between the architect and the artists who were commissioned to make works for the hotel. Um, so they include Eric Revillius, um, Eric Gill and Marion Dawn whose rugs you can see here in the images. Um, they were hand knotted and designed by Marion Dawn. Um, and much of the correspondence actually captures discussions about design ideas and about materials. So that really supports um, that copies can be made, new versions can be made. Um, but it also relates, a lot of it actually relates to work that was never commissioned or artists who weren't selected, um, which sort of opens up the possibility to consider what might have been as well and helps us to think about new new areas for research. Um, could I have the next slide, please? 
Um, so using the archives um, as evidence of the past and therefore restoring sensitively, um, it really means that buildings can retain its supporters, retain their supporters and its, their place in the hearts of the community. So if part of the significance of a historic site is about the meaning it holds for a community, then I think the archive can really support this. And in the case of the Midland Hotel, the friends of the hotel who were really active in the campaign to save it are now supporters of the hotel who are really working to ensure its success and its sustainability. So I think the hotel is a good example of the way that archival material can be put to really good use as part of campaigns to save historic sites. Um, so images showing buildings in their prime can really be used to help foster affection in the mind of the public and support, build support for campaigns to save heritage sites at risk. Um, so the value of the archive can be in stirring the imagination of the public. So to envision, envision oh my goodness, envision <laughs> um, not what is, but also what could be. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Um, I think particularly in the case of buildings that have been neglected or that have become derelict, it can be really, really hard to see beyond the actual and through to the possibility. And I think that's where the archive can be really valuable in as a source for inspiration, um, rather than simply evidence of the past. Um, the archive can be a really, really active agent um, in allowing people to see a future rather than just simply fostering feelings of nostalgia for the past, um, which was actually something in the case of the Midland Hotel, the architects really talked about not wanting create, to create a pastiche, not wanting to create a museum, but wanting to create something that was sustainable and contribute, contribute to the future of the community. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Um, so my next example is, um, I realise, quite similar actually. Um, so this is Salt Dean Lido, um, and this slide is just showing, is showing an image from the Reba collections, um, and that same image being used as promotion for the Lido on the Lido's webpage. Um, so the Lido was designed in by R. W. H. Jones um, between 30, 1937 and 1938. Um, it opened in 1938, but had fallen into disrepair by the 1950s, was revived in the 60s, but was closed again in the 90s and was facing permanent closure and actually redevelopment into housing, um, which is when the Save Salt Dean Lido campaign was established, so in 2010. Um, so the campaign has been really, really successful. It's now, the Lido is now managed by a community interest company. Um, the pool has been reopened and they recently campaigned to um, raise funds to refurbish the cafe building. Um, and I think it's a really good example of how, where they've used the archi archival images to really help capture the public imagination and then public support to help save the building for future. And um, may I have the next one, please? Um, so the next slide is showing, um, again, it's an image from the collections, um, which has been used in, I just took a screenshot of a crowdfunder campaign film, um, which has been used in um, quite recently, actually, to raise money for works to the cafe building. Um, and I think you can also see in this one, um, the lettering, so the deco lettering um, on the front of the cafe, was it was neon lit and was therefore removed during the Second World War, um, subsequently lost. Um, but now, because we have these sorts of images, has been recreated and I think really does add a lot to the character um, of the building. And the fountain that you can see just in the sort of right hand corner of the image, that's also been reinstated. Um, so I'd just like to finish and sort of wrap up by talking a little bit, which we've, has been touched on by both Melanie and Heather, but just a little bit of some of the issues that can be encountered with architectural archives. Um, so as Melanie pointed out in the case of Portland Place, um, 
Architectural records are really quite vulnerable, um, often due just to the physical size of them. They can be really difficult to store. Thank you <laughs> for the next image. Um, so this is an image of the Reba out store that I took just prior to the lockdown in March. Um, and you can just see the size of the tubes. Um, and due to size, um, drawings are most commonly stored rolled, but then I think we've all tried to use something that's been rolled. It's really hard. It just falls back. It just flips back on itself. So I think, and particularly when records are seen as working documents, they can be really, really vulnerable to exactly those sorts of office clear outs that Melanie talked about in um, the case of Fallen Place. Um, and in my previous role, actually, at the Church of England, it was a problem that we faced really quite often. So there, the former architects department had um, it done exactly that. They had cleared out the office. They've gotten rid of the plans because they were work, considered to be working plans. Um, and once they had sold on the building, they didn't really see the value in keeping them. Um, and so what would often happen would be um, that people would have recently bought the Ye Olde Vicarage and they would come back to the archive hoping for lovely visuals um, of their, you know, of their home. And most often we would, there would just be a gap where it should have been, um, which is obviously incredibly disappointing to people. Um, but also um, is an example of where other things can come in. So while we often didn't have the drawings, we would have things like um, surveys or we would have um, building specifications. And so actually you can get a lot of detail and a lot of rich, that sort of rich detail detail from things that are not necessarily visual. Um, the other thing that actually can really support, um, really be useful is um, deeds, rental records, things that can give people a sense of the history of a site, even if it's not visual. Um, so I think um, there's, yeah, they're thinking about the architectural archive sort of as a whole and thinking about connecting up the written records with the visual records with the photographs is really, really valuable. Um, one of the things that I'm currently sort of struggling with with my project is, um, and I think is common across design archives, um, is that they'll often, often it's really hard to know what has actually been executed. So whether it was a fine, whether it's a final design or not, it can be really, really difficult. If you don't know the building, um, it can be really difficult to read what you're looking at. Um, and I think there, there is obviously the very popular misconception that the archive is absolute evidence of the path of the past, that it's a sort of an unassailable truth. Um, and it can, that can really trip you up. So I think that's why thinking of the architectural archive as sort of as broader as being the visual records, as being the job files, as being all of the other things that surround um, surround the drawings is, is really, really valuable. Um, and I think the um, dispersed nature, as um, Heather talked about, particularly in relation to Port Sunlight, is another reason why um, this sort of project is really, really valuable and hopefully will really better support um, heritage sites. Um, so that's kind of me. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy and Melanie. That was that was really delightful and really exciting um, to think about uh, your, your, your work before joining the Reba and, and presently. I absolutely adore those um, Art Deco buildings. And I think probably Port Sunlight residents are sort of thinking, oh, although it wasn't Art Deco, wouldn't we love to have our Lido back? That would be great. Um, the last two slides are really just to say thank you. Thank you to the National Lottery Players for funding the Drawn Together project. Thank you to our wonderful project volunteers, UARM, NML, World Archives, Bolton Library, Museum Services, and also thank you to our presenters in the Reba. And lastly, thank you to you, our guests. Um, this Last page, I will cut and paste into the chat room so you can copy, but it includes um, contact details 
and links as well as a link to a feedback survey that I would really, really love for you to complete as it helps us improve and also enables us to give feedback to the Heritage Fund about the impact that Drawn Together can make. So I now hand it over to you and the chat room. Let me bring that up if you have any questions. Um, I'll try and bring it up. Oop, where is it? Chat, there we go. Okay, oh, ah. Okay, so we've got, we've got some comments. I'm sure everyone can see. Thank you for those, that's lovely. Here I'm going up. Oops. Okay. All right. So we've got some lovely comments. Um, Carlos asks if we'll be able to share the presentation slides. Um, the answer is is yes. I need to double check with um with Reba about all of their images, but I really cut back on what I could have included to make sure that it was in within my copyright to include what I've shown. So yes, the, the slides and in fact, the recorded talk will be available on Port Sunlight Village Trust YouTube page. So I'll pop a link in that. So we'll circulate an email after the event and I'll pop the link in there. Thank you everyone. Oh, Jeanette, Jeanette asks about the drawings. So Jeanette, the drawings are digitized to increase access for everyone. Um, I had hoped to launch an online catalog um, with this event, but for various reasons, mostly related to COVID-19, uh, delivery of that has been delayed. So there will be an online catalog with about 300 of the drawings from, from the um, combined collections, but there'll be a complete catalog so that people can search and um, hopefully find what they're looking for and then either get in touch with Port Sunlight Village Trust or the original collection holder for a, a digital copy of that, which could be shared. It's just copyright prevents us from posting all of them. Yes, Jacqueline, we have recorded the meeting and, and hopefully it will be available on our um, YouTube site, Port Sunlight Village Trust YouTube site. Um, Amy and Melanie, that's one for you. Do you see that? Yeah, um, so the question is whether we, archive and digitize old schedules or scopes of work for historic buildings, not just the drawings? The answer is yes. Um, our archives contain a whole range of things. Um, Amy, I'm sure, can tell you about all of the, the job files and things that they're going through with Collins and John Wilson. Um, they are digitized sometimes. We do offer a reprographics service. So if there's ones people are particularly interested in, we can scan them for them specifically once we're back in the offices. Um, but yeah, the, the collections are very broad. We have all kinds of things relating to um, various projects to kind of try to give as complete a picture as possible. Great. I know that we've found um, using schedules and scopes of work that are um, in property files incredibly helpful for heritage site management. Um, plans for exhibiting the Unilever drawings. Now, I, I can't speak for you, Arm, of course, but the digital collection created through John Together will be available online. Not all of it, a fragment of it. So about 300 of the 1500 that have been digitized. And that includes the incredible collections from NML, which have absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous drawings of Lady Lever and Christ Church. Um, holdings from rural archives, which are a lot of the building control records. And then Bolton Library and Museum Services has the most absolutely incredible collection of a single terrace, um, along with the Jonathan Simpson collection. But the Bradshaw Gas and Hope collection that Bolton holds, that's, that's literally everything from the earliest sketches to the final construction details. It's absolutely gorgeous. So 
the, the online catalogue will have bits and pieces of all of that. It's just um, due to capacity and copyright, we can't put it all up there. Uh, the catalog, do you mean an index for drawn together? So the catalog will be, that'll be, that'll be published on the online exhibition, which fingers crossed, as long as no other catastrophe befalls us all, um, we'll have that up before Christmas. So yes, the catalog will be available. Original, so Steve, hello Steve. Steve asks if were the original drawings submitted by Lutchens for the proposed block of four dwellings at 17 to 23 Cornish Road passed and accepted in their entirety or did they have any have to submit any amendments? See, this is insider information because he knows that Lutchen was, Lutchens was rejected because he, he photographed them. So that's cheeky, Steve. Um, so eventually, yes, it was um, revised, resubmitted and approved. Yes. So we do have a Lutchens in Port Sunlight. Thank you, Yu Yang. That's lovely. Anyone else? Thank you, Dave. OK, um, I'm going to I'll stop sharing my screen and I will copy the links into the chat room and then I think we will bid you adieu but uh, let me get this in there so you can see it and please please do take the time to do the survey as this was um this was a free free lecture free talk so in a way this is your this is your um this is your response, let's see. If you could complete the survey, that would be really brilliant. Okay, so I'll have one last call for questions. I'll put myself back on. Let's see, so you can see that I exist. And I'm quite pleased to say that my daughter managed to not run in and interrupt, which is really lovely. Hi, Amy, so there we all are. You could just pop in and say hello, goodbye. And there's Melanie. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so very much. Be well. And um, through Eventbrite, I will circulate the links and hopefully the link for the YouTube channel cast of this presentation. And um, eventually, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll put in there if you're happy for me to continue to communicate with you. I could create a database for the announcement of the online exhibition and I can keep you posted on that as well. Okay. All right, thanks so much everyone, bye-bye.